recap. Way back in the beginning of St. John's Richmond, we had regular Sunday lectures after the service. And we had uh, people from the congregation who, including clergy from time to time, that would speak on a whole bunch of different topics, <laughs> book reviews, um, theological topics, just kind of anything that was of interest. And um, because of the pandemic and the complications of shifting into the hall three years ago, we haven't really had the opportunity to pull this together until now. And I'm really excited to welcome Norm Van Eden Peterson as our first inaugural, re-inaugural, restart um, SJR Sunday Lecture speaker. Norm now, Norm has been in his life a pastor in a Presbyterian church and uh, finished that position up this summer and became a staff member of Strong Towns. Strong Towns is a movement um, started by Chuck Marone, a, uh, an engineer um, uh, for the city in Brainerd, Minnesota, correct? And he realized in his work as a city planner, zoning planner, engineer, that the city was not working for its citizens and it wasn't working financially. In other words, uh, many cities, both in America and in Canada, are in huge debt because of infrastructure that uh, just, it can't, it can't be fixed up in time as it decays. And there's fundamental errors in the way that cities have been developed since, since World War II. Strong Towns seeks to address that in a number of different ways. Um, Norm, I'm really excited that he, this is a passion for him, it has been a passion for him, even while he was still a pastor. And what he's gonna do for us in the next hour is try and integrate the gospel and healthy city life from the lens of justice and of human flourishing. So I'm really excited to welcome you as our first uh, speaker. The topic, the gospel in the city, um, Norm, over to you. Yeah. <laughs> I care about this because it affects the way that I live, but I also think it affects the way that we all live. Talking about, well, about the way that our cities are constructed and the assumptions that we have about what constitutes a good life. I grew up on a farm and I thought as a farm kid with two siblings that were about my age that never seemed to want to play with me. I thought that the city life seemed amazing. Hmm. To be able to just have kids on a neighborhood street and play hockey, I had a vision and a perception that that's all that my friends did. <laughs> they only ever always got to hang out with other kids in their neighborhood, exploring freely and figuring out what it takes to just live and enjoy and play sports and do all the things that I stuck on the farm couldn't do. Turns out, village life, city life is not quite like that. And as we increasingly hear, it used to be like that a little, it's increasingly becoming not like that at all. Then I went and did lots of things, but worked in the city government, did other stuff along the way of getting trained and go to become a pastor. And then when I was pastoring a small church, well, relatively small church in Vineland, Ontario, I was trying to understand why the community that I lived in felt broken. People, it was a nice little community, and yet you would rarely see people walking. You would not see a lot of activity. People weren't cycling. I thought, what's wrong with you all? Well, as I began to explore, I realized a key part of it is there were two major crossroads running right through the community, and there would be heavy trucks. There was always a sense of noise and clamor, and it just wasn't pleasant. And so as I began to consider that, I thought, why is my community the way that it is? And that's where I came across what Strong Towns was doing, saying it's a design. Uh, this development pattern that we have, this experiment that has been taking place ever since World War II, is one that is not working and should be reversed. That was couched in a very uh, technical way. There, were, there are clear financial implications to what's happening. There are clear social reasons to what's happening. Kids don't play like they used to. There are all sorts of other reasons, uh, but today I want to touch on why this matters from a theological or from a personal religious perspective as followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. I want to begin with a concept of mercy. Mercy 
Maybe a very, very simple non-theological definition is something you receive or give at some cost to the giver that is not reciprocated. So think of what it is for someone to be merciful to you after you've been a jerk to them. They give to you warmth when what you deserve is the opposite. Uh, They give to you kindness or they give to you an embrace, a hug, where you think, I had no claim to this hug because of what I've done, and yet in mercy, this person has done that for me. Or a mercy is a cup of cold water. Someone is in need. Another person of themselves gives it, not because of a check, not because of some obligation, but just out of mercy. And yet, one of the key things to remember is that mercy is costly. The cost may vary. A cup of cold water, depending on which part of the world you live in, will be more or less challenging to acquire. And yet, at its core, mercy is something that, when we think of it on a personal relationship, we want to be able to think, how am I being characterized by mercy? Because... God has been merciful to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. Why? Not because we had earned it in any way, not because we could reciprocate it in any way. We could not return to the Lord the mercy that he had shown to us. And so at its core, we are people marked by mercy. We are marked as those who have received something that we could not give, And we are marked by something so costly, so valuable, the life of the Son of God, given to take away our sins, to restore us to full relationship. And as a result, one of the characteristics of a disciple is that they be merciful. Remember when Jesus deals with his disciples, he says, why are you squabbling? Show mercy to one another. Why are you looking at the sinful woman caught in adultery? Show mercy to her. Why Lazarus, I mean uh, Zacchaeus, after his conversion, why is it that he thought, I'm going to go and make things right? But he did more. He, out of mercy, out of joy, said, I will make it up to you in many fold. And the person to whom he was now restoring himself was suddenly the beneficiary of a costly gift from Zacchaeus. Think of many other instances, but above all, we think of Christ, the Son, showing mercy to us. And so if we... Lay claim and think of this enough. We say mercy transforms us. But what does mercy look like when we are developing communities? What does mercy look like when there is maybe a less clear cost to us? What we should do about roads? What policy should we have about housing? How should we protect land values? So we think, oh, all of those things have, have nothing to do with mercy, but You're here today to learn that, no, it definitely does. There will be situations in our current capitalized, uh, self-interested society really wrestles with this, where people will oppose many things because it will be costly to them. A bike lane will slow down their commute. An effort to develop a community gardening space may have a few smells associated with it. There may be some discomfort or even challenges related when when those that are hard to house are located in a property close to you, or when you yourself need that place, and yet you also take action to help others come into it as well. And so when we think of this, I want to think of it in the biblical context as well, that when God created us, he placed us in a well-supplied garden. One of the things that stands out in the Genesis narrative is how you could say a fully stocked cupboard that God gave to us. He didn't tell Moses or Adam and Eve, tell you what, here's a bare plot of land. Uh, I have an idea. You make it happen. No, God made it happen. And then he said, what? Go forth and multiply. Go forth and flourish. Fill the earth from the very pattern, from the very example that's there. And yet what is so striking is that one of the first things we read of what they did immediately after is they began to develop cities. They began to create places for people to gather, not just untouched wilderness, 
because the untouched wilderness is not the place of God's people. A land flowing with milk and honey requires someone to milk it and someone to steal it. You got to get the bees to do their thing and you got to get the cows to do their thing. And you got to do it through human labor, through industry, through working together. And so it is so striking to us that by the time you get to Revelation 21, we have a vision of a heavenly garden. No, a heavenly city, a heavenly gathering place. The Bible describes a future in a city, which means we are all at core urbanists. That is, we care about the urban life. Well, no matter where we live, we may live in smaller places, apply these examples, these images in smaller ways or in, in more tight-knit ways, in cities and the, the hustle, the bustle, all of these things uh, apply to us as uh, we work on them. And I want to turn to Isaiah chapter 58. Uh, I think it was just previewed in the email that went out. But in Isaiah chapter 58, the message translation by Eugene Peterson uh, does a remarkable job of explaining uh, what it is that Isaiah, as a voice of the Lord, was showing to the people who were there. The preceding four verses were taking up the question of God's confrontation of the Israelites saying, you guys are going about fasting all wrong. You guys are insisting uh, that if you do one day of fasting and do it humbly, sort of externally, then, then you're good. And he said at the same time, addressing social problems in Israel, he said you're exploiting your neighbor, you're harming those around you. We would apply your uh, pillaging the environment and robbing it of its resources, or you're taking advantage of situations that you know is, are not sustainable in the long run. And so God asked the people, do you think this is the kind of day, the uh, fast day I'm after, a day to show off humility? That's the central challenge. Or for Christians as disciples, do you think it's enough? Show up on Sunday. Or do you think it's enough to just have the right thoughts in mind? Well, this is the kind of fast day I'm after to break the chains of injustice, get rid of exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, cancel debts. These are all interrelational items. These are all about how God's people, particularly within the community of Israel, were to relate to each other. Notice each of them breaking the chains of injustice. That requires a merciful action. To say, I will care about it and do something about it. It wasn't just that the person that was using the chains of injustice would be called to this task. No, we were all collectively called to that. Getting rid of the exploitation in the workplace, that was for masters. But it also would be the responsibility maybe of a family member. Brother or sister, you need to stop what you are doing. You are exploiting those that are vulnerable. Or think of freeing the oppressed, even talked about costliness, canceling debts. The Old Testament contains in it, in the society that God established in the Old Testament era, a provision to regularly cancel debts. We ought to consider in our own way of applying this, what would that look like in our own time? We don't live in the same theocracy that Israel lived in. And yet these are patterns that display, maybe not uh, in its first glance, Mercy, But when we realize at its core, this is what it is. It's providing something to others at cost to ourselves, but also with great benefit to all. Each of these are things that cause the place that God's people are in uh, to flourish. Isaiah's prophecy goes on, I'm interested in seeing you do this. Share your food with the hungry. Invite the homeless poor into your homes. Put clothes on the shivering ill-clad. Be available to your own families. Do this, and the lights will turn on, and your lives will turn around at once. I think Jesus is picking up on this when he talks about the people of God, the people of faith, being those who are like lights set on a hill. Those that are visible, those are on display. Your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help, and I'll say, here I am. God, the God of mercy, delights to see his people. 
living out the very things that are happening to us. Jesus tells the parable of the man who had many debts forgiven. And the obligation and the expectation for him was that he would go forth and do likewise. And similarly, we are to give that thought as well. Isaiah goes on, and this closing bit is the part that I especially want to highlight as we carry out uh, this next 15 minutes or so. He goes on, I will, God speaking here, I will always show you where to go. I'll give you a full life in the emptiest of places, firm muscles, strong bones, which for an agrarian society, that would have been especially helpful. Ring in the harvest, wrangle the cows, steal the honey from the bees. A full life, even in the emptiest of places. I grew up in southern Alberta in a place called Palliser's Triangle. It's named that because a man named Palliser looked at the land and said, nothing will grow here. What has happened since is flourishing life in the full in the emptiest of places. Uh, think of many other places around the world. Uh, modern day Israel, for those that have traveled there, you will see stark contrast between places where there is burdency and, and abundance and flourishing, although with forms of exploitation as well as a footnote. But at the same time, you see the contrast, these places that are even the emptiest of places, and the Lord says, I'll give you a full life there. Now, this was the anticipation of God's people for a season as they returned to the Lord, as the Lord ministered to them in his mercy. But it also applies to us as we say, we live now post-Christ, fulfilling the great demand of the law for us. But we are now waiting for Zion. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. But in this time, we wait. In this time, we seek to make things a little bit better. In this time, we seek full lives, even in sin-filled places. Full lives in troubled places. Full lives in crazy, expensive, no-one-can-live-here places. What does the Lord say? When you set your heart on serving others, on living with mercy, you'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew. Think of that in the context of continuing to build out our communities, strengthen what we have using old rubble. That's a description of the old rubble happened because of war. Old rubble happened because of decay. Seasons of hardship. And what does the Lord say? Even seasons of hardship can be overcome. My work with Strong Towns, one of the examples that a lot of people try to say, oh, is, oh, we don't want to end up like the city of Detroit, a city that has been shrinking, a city that is deeply troubled by financial problems and all of that. And yet what we've been able to show is on case study after case study that, that Detroit has within it the ability to rebound, to regrow as neighborhoods and communities are strengthened. Simply by removing, uh, for example, one of the situations that national banks in the United States were not lending to homeowners in Detroit. Well, then you're going to get rubble. You're going to get decay. And the turnaround is there were community groups that said, fine, we'll lend money. We'll lend money one to another. If I have a secured loan, I will then secure a loan for you. I will help. And you're beginning to see communities being rebuilt rather than fleeing or going into a new exile. Using the old rubble of past lives to build anew, rebuild the foundations from out of your past. What if the people of St. John's, if each of us in our own way became known as those who can fix anything? Now, Sean is maybe closest in terms of being a handyman. <laughs> But I think for all of us, we can think, is there some brokenness around me that I can strive to be fixing? Some struggle that people are going through uh, that I can encounter. Uh, to restore old ruins. There's a cherishing of what is past there. While at the same time rebuilding and renovating, making the community livable again. Making the community livable again. I want to apply this in the next 10 minutes uh, in terms of what it means to fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, and make the community livable again, to think of it in the context of housing. An act of mercy is to be welcoming. It is, at times, costly to welcome someone. People like good neighbors, 
but they're not always so sure about bad neighbors. And if it's in the mix, and you have a way to subtly influence it so you only get good neighbors, which happened in our cities by mandating a certain width of the property that you live on. City planners, egged on by neighbors, said, if we make the properties large, then only those with funds sufficient to buy that large property will be able to move in. And tell you what, what we'll do is we'll make sure that we do not allow anyone to put more than one house on that property. And so if they want to have their brother move in from a country that has they've immigrated from, used to be from Ireland or from Germany, uh, these days it's from other countries, it seems no matter what generation, there's always an out group. Large lots, single homes on there. Let's make sure that we are also excluding certain types of businesses. Vancouver, for many, many, many years, had strict regulations as to where laundromats were allowed to occur. It wasn't because people didn't get their clothes dirty. It's because Chinese immigrants ran the laundromats. And the context of these bans and these exclusions was specifically designed to keep certain communities in certain places. Again, I mentioned I'm more familiar with the Vancouver history than Richmond's to a certain extent. But in Vancouver, you had situations where certain neighborhoods were dedicated for black community, the black community to live. And then conveniently, from the perspective of those that were racist and seeking to instill certain patterns within a city to preserve uh, privileges, they ran highways through it, or it didn't even get fully to it. The Granville Expressway didn't even get fully built, but the neighborhoods that it was supposed to go through were still torn down. Uh, you can go visit Hogan's Alley as a dis uh, depiction of this. And so how does this relate to what we can do? We can certainly ask ourselves, am I welcoming, not just generally in the sense of if I meet someone, do I smile or do I look at them with kindness? Do I see them as a fellow brother or sister? But do I also institutionally, have I let my city council know that I am in favor of more housing in my community? If there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families struggling because they're burdened by rent costs, if there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that have been priced out of where they were living and are now slipping into homelessness, am I letting my community know, and my leaders in particular, I want more housing? Am I just waiting for the situation for just the right project to come along? Or am I just letting them know, I am for these things. I am actively welcoming new types of housing. It doesn't have to be super tall towers. It can be a three-story walk-up apartment with ground-level units for seniors to live in, so that way it's accessible for them, with two stories of family housing above it. Suddenly, that what used to be one property with one house on it and a, a homeowner that lived here only six months of the year now is a place for four families and a couple of individuals. Think of townhouses. Think of all of the different types of housing uh, that we have. One of the things that we're doing in Delta is we're trying to make people aware that apartments, what we traditionally would refer to as apartments, rental apartments, are banned in well over 90% of our city. So wherever we have housing lands, 90% of it is off limits. What does that do when there is scarcity? Economics 101. It raises the cost. And so even to build a small portion of apartment housing is now way more expensive than it would otherwise be. And so we have a situation in Delta in our, our community where we have one road called Evergreen Lane, and it has a whole bunch of older, affordable rental apartments. And they're being bought, and they're going to be torn down and replaced with what is in all likelihood not going to be affordable, available rentals. Why? Because the very same person that would consider purchasing an apartment there, I mean, would consider building an apartment, I should say, is forbidden from buying the properties nearby, is forbidden from building around, but instead must go to that one place where there are apartments and do their work there. And so, as a consequence, a single family home is preserved while a multi-family unit is destroyed. 
even though the multifamily unit costs seven times the amount that the single family home would. Different types of housing need to be embraced. And if we think of what it takes to rebuild and renovate, notice not just restoring old, old ruins, leave them as they are. The old, ancient world knew nothing of that. They kept a little bit of Solomon's temple, but the rest of it was new. They kept a little bit of things. They, they remembered certain guide stones. Remember Moses when they crossed the Jordan, or uh, Joshua when they crossed the Jordan River. They established these, these pillars, these towers as continued remembrances. We do well to do that. These are, are public markers of heritage. But at the same time, we don't say let's leave our communities as they are. And so we also address existing rules which privilege the wealthy and expose the vulnerable uh, to risks. We say in Delta, uh, our neighborhoods are changing. They are profoundly changing because market changes and because time is passing. We have to choose, will they become more exclusive and expensive, the path that they are currently on, or will we change these rules to allow them to be more inclusive and more diverse? So that way you can have a diversity of different housing types all around. What about on our streets? Those who can make the community livable again. I said mercy means making room for the vulnerable, which in this context means those not in 3,000 pounds of armor. <laughs> that is not in a car. This is uh, just next door to the Eiffel Tower. I think the Eiffel Tower is like right here. If you were an alien looking in from space, which part of this do you think would have, which part do you think the alien would say these people value the most? The sidewalk or the space for cars? This where there's a cluster of what, 50 people? Or here where there's one person? You can see clearly in the way that we lay out our spaces what it is that happens. And so there's an urbanist that says this is a description of the arrogance of space. Red is space for cars. Blue is space for pedestrians. Here you see your crosswalks, but even those are contested areas as a car will push forward. Don't do that. If you're a driver, don't push up on a pedestrian. Don't harass them or make them feel unwelcome or feel more vulnerable. But notice, this is right next to one of the most famous landmarks, and so much space is devoted to this. But it's not just in Paris. I took this as an example. This is General Curry Elementary School. We see housing all around. And I just marked in red how much space we devote to cars. We've got, and this is not even a, an egregious example, but you notice all of the different ways and what was happening in my community in Vineland is that anywhere there was this gap, it became, a pers or people felt that it was unsafe. Kids might play within this little period, but they would not, or even this school. Many kids are not walking to school or biking to school. Because this, and number three road here, and number two, uh, four road just a little ways further, all of your major crossroads become barriers. People talk about children being raised in archipelagos or on islands, that they have a little island, and then they need to get in a boat in order to traverse to the next place. Or I, I like to say, we think of our cities almost as if they are outer space colonies. And in order to get from one place into the next, I must get into my space movement suit and then get into my vehicle and make my way because we've made it unsafe for children. We've made it unsafe for the vulnerable. We've made it a challenge for others. And so what do we mean? Mercy compels us to examine how we might change for others' well-being. I would need to get a sticker, but then I need to live up to it for our car that says neighborhood pace car. A pace car in a race is the car that goes around the track and all the other cars have to keep speed with it. I would encourage each of you to get a sticker. Be the neighborhood pace car. Slow down where you live if you are driving. Or another thing you can do for those that are able, for those that are able to do so, is make a point of saying, can I replace certain trips with a bicycle trip or with a walking trip? Maybe I'll purchase something nearby rather than going at some distance to some further place. 
or challenging us, thinking of what it means to make our communities livable again. Do we caution ourselves when we're buying online <laughs> with a whizzing around of delivery trucks and all of the different things that are so convenient and yet come at a considerable cost? And so livable places, uh, Isaiah says we seek to make the community livable again. This is a situation for Isaiah's time where they had to do so after war. War breaks out, destruction, and what is Isaiah prophesying? You will be those that make communities livable again. The rubble, broken down, will be made into something fresh again. We say, oh yeah, if the big one hits, we're going to be all in this together. We're going to rebuild Metro Vancouver. But how do we rebuild after greed has done its dirty deeds for the last, well, I can say this 100 years 200 years. I know it's a long-term problem, but we see greed, especially in the way uh, that our land use policies, policies that deliberately exclude certain groups, policies that since World War II were designed uh, to build cities in a different way around the scale and speed and distance of an automobile instead of the scale and speed and distance of a person on foot. That has been a profound change to the way that our cities are built. On foot, you would see, and you see this in historical patterns of development, cities would build in a cluster. There would be more value concentrated in the middle, and then around the edges, the fringe, you would have the development of low-cost things. There would be less services on the fringes, a 15-minute walk from the core. But then, in time, you would see the next 15 minutes from there begin to develop its own little cluster. People say, I need that in my community. You have, uh, my, my boss talks about his town, had 26,000 people in it. They had five barbers uh, just 50 years ago. Now they have zero because everybody drives to the city to go get their haircut. And many other situations like that where everything becomes built around the scale, the speed, and the, so and the distance of the automobile. And so what I am passionate about with Strong Towns is that this is an ill-fated experiment to build around the needs of the automobile and the assumption that everyone will be in a vehicle or have access to one to get driven around. Cost of ownership, I think, is climbing up to $10,000 a year for an individual to have and operate a vehicle. Does that mean that we want the first $10,000 that we earn each year or that we receive in government supports or other things like that to be expected to come off or else we live a substandard or, or troubled, or not necessarily troubled, but challenged, more challenging life. We wanna make the community livable again. We wanna to begin to address these things by supporting housing, but also supporting efforts to introduce multiple ways of moving on our streets. Bike lanes, pedestrian paths that aren't just a little whisker on the side of the road. Situations that we have in Lander is our hydro poles, rather than on the road, taking up a parking space, they get stuck in the sidewalk. You probably see this in Richmond too. And then why couldn't it not just be in the road? It would lose half of a, per uh, well, but half of a parking space would be taken up. And no, it gets stuck in the sidewalk to be a burden for anyone in a wheelchair, anyone pushing a stroller. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so, after this ill-fated experiment, properties like this, the development pattern like that is banned. The development pattern of the suburbs, notice opportunities for connection, opportunities for knowing your neighbor, opportunities for looking in on each other. Where is the orientation of this? There's one window there, a peeper window. You're not supposed to use it, make sure it's frosted. Everything is out and away. Everything is disconnected. And Richmond still bears the marks of that pattern of development as well. Now there are backyards, but they're all the same, which says to me, people aren't really using them. Because when we use them, we make them our own. Uh, they become diverse, they become interesting, and they become our own. I want you to think, I'm going a little bit over it to give ourselves a bit of time for questions, but I want to make this point too. Think about the road that is shared by the robbers and the priests and the Pharisees and the vulnerable man and a Samaritan in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, what would that road look like? You think, oh, well, it was just a 
a, a part of the story. He said, no, the, the road that they were on mattered. Did it look like this? Or perhaps it looked a little bit more like that, snaking through the wilderness. That's the way that Jesus describes it in the story. And the, vul- the man, as he was walking, was vulnerable to robbers as they were along the way. And the priests and the Pharisees said, oh, this isn't good. And they were trying to get through there as fast as they can because they understood the problem. What would it look like this? Connecting communities together, but still being relegated to limited means of, of getting around, especially if you began to run cars down that road. If this is a pedestrian path, all of a sudden it becomes much more desirable. A priest, a Pharisee might say, going out for an evening stroll, I'm going to use this. But we don't have a lot of places that connect communities in this way, do we? Think of the challenge of developing a cross-Canada bike route or other means of, of allowing communities to connect together. Or a great initiative here in our area is the Great Heron uh, Bike Way, or the Great Heron Path. It's connecting, I think it's 40 First Nations communities along the coast of the Fraser River and the Salish Sea and running bike routes and walking paths all the way along it from basically from Tawasin all the way up into Pitt Meadows and beyond. It's a remarkable initiative, and yet it is being fought at every corner by private landowners, golf courses, heavy industry, saying the last thing that we want is anybody passing through our space. Even though it would allow the First Nations communities to reconnect, to re-engage certain rituals of moving from community to community to socialize, to care for one another, to celebrate together. And as good neighbors, they have said, we want not just our nations to be using this, but everyone at some cost to themselves saying, you, though this land is contested and we have not yet ever given over every part of it, yet at the same time, we welcome you to use this path once it is created. So something very tangible, the Great Heron Way, uh, would be an example of this. Think of this instance. Now all of a sudden, this person on this path, and a priest, a Pharisee, and a vulnerable man, and a Samaritan would all feel, know what this feels like, uh, to be faced with being in contested space. Being in contested space where it's not clear, are you even allowed to be there? They're trespassing. They're jaywalking. See how the interests and the needs of the other in the vehicle are prioritized. This this person hasn't yet gotten their ticket, but they are being assured, even in the the way that the street is created, uh, that they are not fully welcome. And this is even a good example where it's quite narrow and the speeds would be quite low. Another way to think of the path of the Pharisee, I mean the path of the vulnerable man that the Samaritan found in was within cities. Do we take steps to ensure that places where people pass, where people move, are livable, or are walkable, are encouraging life? Similarly here, or here. This is in Vancouver. It's the worst bus stop in North America. <laughs> and so this man is waiting patiently on the side of the, I believe on the low heat highway, waiting for the bus to come. It's not great. <laughs> and it does display this question as to whose life and whose access and whose convenience is valued the most. This man will get onto a bus with probably 40 other people, and yet vehicles consume, moving one or two people will have priority over that bus when it looks to make a left turn or when it continues to carry on or when it gets clogged up in congestion. All of these things matter when we think, is there a way that we can sacrifice our own need, or here in Richmond. This is Westminster Highway and Garden City. Those are, that woman standing there is in a very dangerous position. And it is astounding to me that even as improvements are made to the street, I should have included, oh here, we send work crews here and on the other strip to make it beautiful. The flowers on that stretch are one of my favorite parts of driving to church. And I know it's entirely for my sake as a driver that it's there. It offers no protection to her. It offers no benefit. Something beautiful in the middle of the road that you would be jaywalking to go check out is not there for you. What if instead of having that strip in the middle here, 
We made that as tight as it could be, bring the cars together tighter, which actually slows them down. And then guess what? If you've done any sewing, you know that if you cut a strip off one side, you can move that strip to the other side. Suddenly we could do a lot around here, but instead we don't. Accidents happen here all the time. That's why those battered yellow things are there. They probably tell a story of people having to jump, dodge, dive out of the way, or, as is very common, many not making that trip, saying, why would I do that? Don't ask me to stand there. Don't put me in that situation. Children, I have held my son's hand at that intersection and thought, this is the last time I'm doing that. So safety. Um, you'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, and make the community livable again. I want to share uh, the popsicle test. Increasingly, town planning types base their rating of a city as child-friendly on something called the popsicle test. It is familiar to those whose neighborhood probably unknowingly passed it. And it's this. Can a child safely walk to a store, buy a popsicle, and return home before it melts. What would it cost us to allow our communities to look like this? Might we have to drive slower or more thoughtfully for those that drive? Might we have to limit certain routes so that way there was greater pedestrian access? Might we have to change our building types so that way we would have clusters where families live and, critically, stores nearby? Most of our stores are segregated and placed in areas that are we call power centers. Powerful for who? Certainly not for the child seeking a popsicle. I'll close with this. In the Christian tr tradition, this is a quote from a uh, guy, Michael Minatelli, the kingdom of heaven is a city. There it is in Revelation 21. It's a remarkable contrast from the modern Western ideal of suburban withdrawal from cities and quarter acre lots, keeping us arm's length from our neighbors. The kingdom of God is lived in proximity. Coming back to the question of how do we know our neighbor? How do we love our neighbor? How do we serve them? It belongs to those like children, we're told. Heaven, I love this phrase, heaven is a child-friendly city. And if that's true, then it should be on earth as it is in heaven. What does Jeremiah 29 verse 7 say? Seek the welfare of of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. That's why, as we close, mercy transforms us. Something you receive or give at some cost to the giver that is not reciprocated. I ask, are there ways that we can be a part of reshaping the fabric of where we live for the benefit of others? And so that's what I have for today, but we have 15 minutes to take time for questions or even more critically for a discussion. Uh, there's been something that's been uh, triggered for you where you think, oh, I'd love to share this or reflect on something. Uh, let's uh, take this time to do that together.